because we might realise that we've been talking for ages. Emma, I haven't got a watch on, so Emma's going to give me some time signals. Um, uh, do you want to do, shall I do them or do you want to do it? You can't even remember, yes, so, yeah, so it's good I write them down. Yeah. But my writing will be illegible for you. So um, one, one question that we wanted to plant with you um, is how did you participate in the last election? One is what do you think participation in politics could or should look like? And one is, if you had 50 grand and one week in which to run an education program in Bristol to improve politics, what would you do? Um, so, uh, as you can probably tell from the tenor of those questions, uh, we are going to talk quite a bit, or focus quite a bit, on uh, democratic processes and uh, education around democracy, education around politics, and, um, and I think uh, where we'll start is with the word sortition itself, which is not a word that I knew before Selena introduced it to me. Uh, I have just, in, just before everyone came in, uh, looked up the etymology of it, because I love etymology, uh, and, it, and it comes from the Latin word sortire, which means to divide up, which I found really interesting because sortition, or the, the idea of sortition I felt you were working with was not about division, actually, mm. in, that, in that root sense. So, yeah, could you just yeah. tell me about how you encountered the idea of it um, what, and what you, what you felt it might make possible if yeah. more people knew about it? Yeah. Um, so firstly, that etymology, etymology is really interesting to me, and I guess it refers to like the literal way in which sortition was done in ancient Greece, which is that there'd be like a load of balls, <laughs> and you'd split them up, and you'd go, these people are in and these people are out, um, This, which is interesting to me. Mm. Anyway, um, so I first heard about sortition around the time that we were voting on Brexit as a country. Uh, I was in the car with my friend Rich. He was working on a piece for his company at the time, Invisible Flock, um, where he was going around, around the world and interviewing people on new ways in which it could be run. And he had emailed, not emailed, interviewed David Van Raybrook, I think is his name, who wrote a book called Against Elections, which you can now buy with a picture of Donald Trump's face <laughs> on the front. Um, and in it, he advocated for sortition. And I think the way that Rich described it to me was that you would do it by lottery. You would have people, you would pick people at random to run the country. And I kind of thought this was really exciting. And then, a few days later, I remember that when I was like 
18 and dead into Russell Brand. Don't judge me, I've moved past that. Um, I used to go to London to see his shows with friends uh, and they were very cool. They had zines, they watched like David Lynch films and uh, this was like mind blowing to me. And um, Dan Taylor, who is now a writer and theorist about capitalism, ha was big into sortition as well. He was like, we should put Parliament together the way that we do jury service. So this idea has been, I know we touched on this a bit earlier, but kind of very much communicated to me through word of mouth, mm. in very simple terms. Mm. It's jury service for Parliament, it's picking people at random. Um, and with Rich, it came out of a conversation around the kind of futility of voting in our respective um, constituencies. I wanted to vote for Green and I was in a Labour safe seat. He wanted to vote for Labour. He was in a Conservative safe seat. So it came from this mm -hmm. kind of sense of how do you make it so that all of this stuff counts mm -hmm. wherever you are. Yeah. And with yeah. Dan, I think it was because I was about to vote for the first time and I was very excited and mm -hmm. Dan was not. So <laughs> um, that's where it came mm -hmm. for me. And mm -hmm. then when Claire got in touch to ask if I was interested in putting something forward for this, I was very angry about the proposition of like, sorry, uh, <laughs> of like celebrating voting and the suffragettes because we had just, we were having like the third vote in three years straight. None of it felt useful mm -hmm. to me. Um, I couldn't find a way to connect work that I was doing with other activist organisations, with parliamentary democracy. So I kind of wanted to make something that was a bit more, f fuck you, and was a bit mm. more, actually, no, mm. I don't want to celebrate mm. representation and electoral representation. Mm. I want to make something that pushes harder. Mm. Mm. Um, yeah. There's a lot, of, a lot of things sort of compacted into that. So one is um, something I've been thinking about for a while is uh, partly because my parents are Cypriot, so Greek is in my family background, but kind of the weight of these words that we've inherited from Greek, uh, uh, democracy being one of them, and how uh, the ancient Greek idea of democracy was not everyone having access to political process at all. Uh, what does that mean for us today? Then thinking again about the suffragettes, uh, that wasn't mm. access for absolutely everyone. It was it was a particular group of, of women. Um, so so kind of we've inherited these ideas of, of democracy uh, as actually quite a limited something that the access to it is quite limited. Um, so I think that's that's inside of it. Another thing that's inside of it. Uh, which I will probably return to is I'm, I'm really impressed that you voted when you were 18 because I was way scared to vote when I was 18. Uh, so let's, let, we'll definitely come back to that. Um, uh, but another is uh, uh, Donald Trump's face on that book. You know, we've just had this election in Brazil, democratic election, but it's given us a fascist leader of that country, which is terrifying. Um, and I guess for me, the inside of the idea of uh, 12 people being selected for parliament in the same way that they're selected at random from jury for jury services a, a whole bunch of what ifs what if they're all brexit voters what if they're all ukip people what if what if what if um how how does that how how do you negotiate that how do you think about that <sighs> okay so I'm going to jump jump back to mm, some of the. Mm. Is this a box? Is it elastic bands? Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Uh, so let's jump back to one of the boxes. Let's look at the one that is referencing the Greeks and democracy. So we ran a boot camp week, which we'll probably talk about later. We had mm. lots of people come in and speak to us about democracy. First person to speak to us was a man called Yoram Gat, who was in Israel, uh, and is sort of a big advocate for sortition. And that's really interesting within the context of Israel yeah. and Palestine. Yeah. Um, but there were two things that really stuck with me from what he said. The first was that his definition of democracy is simply political equality. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, that's like mind-bogglingly simple. Mm -hmm. Is that what we have? Mm -hmm. Does that work? Mm -hmm. 
power mm. where does mm. economics come into this mm. all sorts mm -hmm. and the second thing that he spoke about which I think is really important is that democracy is very emotive mm -hmm. you can justify pretty much anything if mm -hmm. you say it's democratic people have a real emotional block between of pushing against it mm -hmm. it's part of how um democracy is such a big part of the like ongoing imperial projects of the rest of the west what have we done we've bombed this country back to the stone age but look they have, they have democracy. democracy and everyone Yay. goes great mm -hmm. um so i'm very interested in that emotional load that mm -hmm. that word carries mm -hmm. where it's weaponized mm -hmm. um and particularly around things like voting and voter apathy, how it's used to shame people mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, so if I skip ahead to the end and to the what if, yes. mm -hmm. what I guess we were looking at with the boot camp, so in July or June, a time in the past, we invited 12 people to come to be in the Arnolfini. We were in the three galleries downstairs. We had all these talkers come in and it was a very like pedagogical kind of project. It was, what do you need to, what knowledge do people need to feel able to run the country themselves? What do you need to put in place for them to feel like they have agency, to feel empowered, um, for them to trust each other? Um, because for all, with all of those what ifs, I feel like what is underlying all of them is the failure of the current political system. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say I'm a big simplistic advocate for sortition. There are problems with it, many. But mm -hmm. I feel a bit like what has the impact of 100 years of electoral representational democracy had on political education in this country, on who we see politics as belonging to, on who we see politics as being done by? One of the, when we were brainstorming questions to ask you guys this afternoon, one of the questions I was interested in asking people was why don't they organise? because, um, and not, not from a place of judgment, it sounds like a really condemning question. Why don't you organize? Mm. But I'm not asking it with a finger pointed, like I'm asking it from like a genuine place of like interest and curiosity. Mm. Why don't people feel empowered and able to organize? And I don't think it's enough to go, they're too busy or they're tired. Mm. There is some of that, but I think people do incredible things when they're tired and busy and overworked if they feel like they can and if they feel like they'll be supported and it will lead to something but organizing for my generation feels very scattered and I could protest a big thing that I think about loads that came out of the boot camp week and all of those people were under 30 and I'm 28 so it's my generation when we spoke about defining political moments in their lives, I think about three of them spoke about the protests against the Iraq war mm -hmm. and the impact of seeing that many people say, we don't want this thing to happen Indeed. and it happening anyway. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I think that there is something that very, very interesting that happens when we think about British millennials politically, if we establish that as a definitive moment. Mm -hmm. I've lost the track of your question no it's fine i want i'd like to pick up on that probably possibly briefly because i also want to come back to the, the boot camp participants but i think about that moment of that protest a lot it's the way in which i have rationalized apathy not among millennials actually who i i don't I mean, you know, this is from what's performed on Twitter, so it's probably, it's possibly a really false perception. But I don't think, I think people in their late teens and early 20s are significantly more politically engaged than I, I was at that time. I think the late teens are like the other generation that's quite Okay, young, yeah, that okay. My generation. Yeah, 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 okay, Which yeah, that's about. interesting. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. But whereas I think that, that um, older, so I'm 43, so kind of people my age and, and either side of me, um, I think something in us broke mm -hmm. with that with that march and the failure of that uh, or that that stream of protest and the failure of that or the the kind of um, and I, and possibly it's got something to do with that um, 
that attitude of like, no, 52% is enough mm. for that to be put, that has to be listened to. Mm. Um, this might all be tangential. So maybe let's come back to the, the boot camp people for a bit. Yeah. Um, how did you, were they selected at random or were they, I mean, they, they already aren't if, you're, mm. if you've chosen people who are under 30. So could you talk a bit about the criteria for selection? Yeah, so this was um, a commission project. So it means that parameters like that, it's always a kind of uh, agreement and compromise between the people that commission and the artists and everybody else that's working to bring it together. So it was an important part of Represent that it was people under 30, kind of 18 to 30 that were the target, people who wouldn't have been able to vote mm -hmm. under the People's Representation Act, mm -hmm. which I thought was a really exciting provocation. Um, we ended up leading with an online campaign, which I feel inadvertently kind of sets another set of parameters mm -hmm. around who's going to participate. Mm -hmm. Because when you're focusing on things online in general, mm -hmm. what it means is that you're gonna find an audience that's already engaged with yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it meant that we ended up with what I would describe as largely a group of people who were arts adjacent. Mm -hmm. But there's still variation and a mm -hmm. great deal that can be done within mm -hmm. that. It's self-selecting because people had to put their names into a form. Um, I was going to say hat, but there was no hat, I don't think. And then there was a degree of random selection, but there were parameters around that that I placed as an artist, which was that we needed to have someone from Scotland, England, mm -hmm. Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, <coughs> and that there was like a, we did have sort of regional outreach and we mm -hmm. were looking for people who maybe are underrepresented in the arts. Mm -hmm. And there were a few people who definitely met that. We also had at least one person from Bristol, which was really important, mm -hmm. I think. Um, so that was kind of how that group came together. Mm. Um, and I think that this is one of the flaws of sortition, is that bring, pulling together that part is never, is never genuinely random. Mm -hmm. In the mm -hmm. same way that in Athens you are looking at white slave-owning men, mm -hmm. in the same way that when the Venetians and the Florentines were putting it into practice, it was the big wealthy families and picking mm -hmm. amongst them. Mm -hmm. um, there were always parameters around it. Mm -hmm. um, and consent and self-selection mm -hmm. is one of the biggest parameters mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because the kind of people that want to talk about politics in general are already thinking about politics. Um, so that's how that group of people came together. So within that group, I think we had, it wasn't a gender balanced at all. We had three boys, three men, um, and nine women, which is about right for the yeah. arts. <laughs> yeah. uh, we had three people of color. Yeah, three people of color. Um, one person, who had immigrated here. Mm -hmm. We had, I think, two people who very confidently identified as working class, mm. and a lot of people who didn't identify as working class confidently, mm -hmm. which is very interesting mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe like two or three people that identified as middle class mm -hmm. confidently. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't have anybody who defined themselves as queer within the room. Mm -hmm. We didn't have anybody we had people who had access needs, but none of them who felt they were in the room as a person with a disability. Mm. So there were these kinds of, I mean, there's the certain amount, there's how much variance can you yeah, get yeah. within 12 people, but yeah, also yeah. sortition doesn't guarantee yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that you're gonna get yeah, yeah. everybody represented. Mm, mm, mm. Not that that's guaranteed in the system we have. Mm, mm. So <coughs> this was the group of 12 that we had. Mm. And they had their own questions and concerns mm. and critiques of who was and wasn't in the room mm, mm, and why, which mm. is very interesting to me. Mm. Given that there's quite a few overlaps that mm. you've described there, um, what, were you, uh, were their uh, politics similarly overlapping or were they, maybe politics is the wrong word there, mm. but, but were their attitudes kind of similarly overlapping or was there more of a divergence than there apparently seemed to be? Mm. I it guess I'm varied. asking what surprised you about them and what didn't maybe? 
What surprised me about them? I was very interested in one participant who was pro-Brexit mm -hmm. and quite white, right wing mm -hmm. and her positioning within that room mm. um, because she was very shrewd in disagreeing and making it clear that her values didn't align mm. but also prioritised consensus. Really interesting. Yeah. There's something about there's something about all having to agree on some things mm. that I think changes how people because nobody I don't think very many people are like simplistically right wing or simplistically mm. left wing mm. or mm. authoritarian or libertarian or whatever mm. kind of more like that mm. um, and I guess what it enables you to do in that room of twelve where you're not representing a constituents mm -hmm. or a party or a mm -hmm. people is to represent yourself. Mm -hmm. So maybe we all form a constellation of agreement about this, mm -hmm. um, but we don't agree about that. Mm -hmm. um, Brexit brought quite a lot, quite a lot of hostility into the room. Mm -hmm. Predictably, um, not a huge amount of, of it surprised me though, mm -hmm. because that mm -hmm. sort of arts adjacent audience yeah. is yeah, one yeah, I'm yeah. familiar with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I think. <coughs> you need more of a of a clash mm. and I also think that again if I think about recent elections there is a big generational gap between how people are voting and how people perceive things mm. and I think if I was doing it again I would want it to be a room that had big age variants yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. because I think yeah. that that is the that is the real conversation yeah. that isn't happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. not even happening in activist circles no. a lot of the time. Yeah. Let alone in. I mean, what's the closest we get to it? Question time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You brought a new word in there: consensus, which mm. uh, which we hadn't, which hasn't come up before, um, and makes me realise that we that there's a, a bit more of unpacking about sortition. Mm. Like, is is the idea of sortition also? that it's a practice of consensus rather than a, the kind of um, uh, counting the votes and majority win? Well, it varies because all sortition is, is a method of selecting process, a group of people. Right, yeah. What that group of people then do when they're together is anyone's guess. So consensus was a decision that you made. That was a decision I made. Why, why did you make that decision? Because... Often our alternative to consensus is to, or our version of consensus is voting. Mm. Mm -hmm. and I kept watching that happen in the week. There would, co be, there would come a moment of impasse and we would do a show of hands. Mm -hmm. But that's not agreeing. That's like who can get the most votes. Mm. And maybe people voting aren't voting because that's what they want and blah, blah, yeah, blah. Yeah, yeah. So for me, what was interesting was what happens when these people have to find a way that either everybody is equally happy or everybody is equally unhappy. Mm -hmm. But either way, we're all on the same plate. Mm -hmm. um, and that was really interesting. That's where it then, that's where then even in a group which could have been monopolitical and monocultural, yeah. Yeah. you're getting a much more interesting conversation. Yeah. 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 No, absolutely. I think there's something about voting that that, that encourages antagonism. Yeah. Um, whereas consensus requires conversation. Because voting is competition. It's yeah. win or lose. Yeah. It's pass or fail. Yeah. So of course, of course, it goes hand in hand with like capitalism yeah. because it's it's competing. And I think a big a big bit of feedback that we got was that that week wasn't about competing yeah. it was about making sure that everybody had enough information and all of the tools that they needed to be able to come to their own conclusions yeah. and a really huge thing for mm, so in against elections David Van Raybrook references this man whose name I can't remember which is really bad but he does lots of um, randomly uh, gathered assemblies around the world to consult on very specific moments of policy. So in China, they did some work that was on retirement age. They did some in Manchester that was about knife crime. Um, they've done loads in the States about all sorts. Um, and for him, they came from trying to find a different way of doing opinion polls. 
He argued that opinion polls ask people to make a decision when they're not thinking, to just mm. uh, say the first thing that comes mm. out of their head mm. as quickly as possible. And then they're really influential as well. Yeah. Mm. And he was like, actually, there has to be a way of doing opinion polls that, first of all, creates the best environments for people to think in. Mm -hmm. So that means time and comfort, mm. consultation with experts, consultation with citizens, mm. um, people being in good humour, people trusting each other, it being mm. well facilitated. Mm. So remember what I was saying. That's okay because uh, it's made it's reminded me that you used the word pedagogy earlier mm. um, and uh, I th did you just use the word instruction as well I can't I can't remember no information it was information um, uh, the what did you what did you provide for your boot camp participants like what did you feel like would be useful education mm. for them in politics? So, well, I'll tell you what happened in the week, but I'll also tell you who we approached. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that we knew we wanted was experts, um, because for better or for worse, the presence of someone in the room who can be defined as an expert, mm -hmm. it's very comforting to people. It lets them know that it can't go too wrong. And I, I get it, but mm -hmm. I also really want to smash that apart because yeah, it's ruining yeah. my life. Yeah, it is. So <laughs> uh, the people that we approached were, I'm gonna need your help with this, Emma. So there's a guy called Duncan who runs something called New Economics uh, and like consults with the Bank of England and people like that. Um, so he came in and spoke to us about economics in the UK and how that works. There's Mike Savage, she came up with the Great British Class Survey. So he was talking to us about class and how that works and what policy needs to be in place for class equality mm -hmm. uh, and why it's never gonna happen. And then <laughs> we also had what was her name? Amazing, taught us how to make a budget for a country. Nonny, who did this great big game. With, like, I wasn't in that session because I had to do other stuff, but there was tape on the floor and they were basically learning to budget for a country and the differences between that and how you budget for a household. Right. And they, they loved that. Yeah. Uh, Yoram, who spoke to us about sortition. Uh, we had a man, f um, an activist from Artists for Brexit. Mm -hmm. We had um, Cleo, who is your Lord Mayor? Okay. Lord Mayor, who came in and spoke about kind of local politics and also the shift from activist to the system that she now works within. Mm, that, so that was off the record, yeah. really yeah. great. <laughs> uh, we also spoke with a lady who is an experimental psychologist. Uh, what was her name? Magda, uh, who works in government, in parliament. Mm. She consults on um, sort of programmes and mm. getting to the heart of how we want to get citizens to do what we want mm. them to do. Mm. So she was talking about uh, a proposal for reducing obesity mm -hmm. uh, and how mm. it could be an education programme or it could be stickers on um, food packets like we get on smoking packets or it could be more subtly coercive mm -hmm. uh, sort of uh, yeah it was great mm -hmm. she was great mm -hmm. so we have all of these experts come in mm -hmm. um, they ask us three questions to think about mm -hmm. so that they can get a sense of what we don't know mm -hmm. and then they talked us through what they did and they talked us through what we needed to bear in mind when running a country mm -hmm. Uh, we had um, a facilitator, Liz Clark, he came in and worked with us um, and I think the big focus was looking at what needs to be in place for good mm -hmm. conversation to take yeah. place. Yeah. Yeah. What does that group of people need to know about themselves mm -hmm. and each other mm -hmm. to feel able to participate in that conversation mm -hmm. fully mm -hmm. and with mm -hmm. respect? Mm -hmm. um, there was a load of stuff that I think both us and the Arnold Feeney kind of run ourselves ragged with in terms of access. So making sure that everybody would be paid, mm. making sure that everybody would have their meals taken care of, their travel taken care of, that there were absolutely no barriers in the way mm. that meant that you couldn't be here mm. and that when you were here, you couldn't be present. Mm. Um, and then we used a lot of Lois Teaver. Mm? No, it's a time, time checks. Lois Weaver's um, systems of public engagement, mm. so porch mm. sitting and long tables in particular. Mm. So mm. Think about different ways of getting this group of people to talk and reflect mm. together. Mm. Um, and then by the end of the week, they were writing their first drafts of a constitution. I need like a month with them. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 But it was a lot of like talking 
pedagogy, mm. um, which is interesting for me. When we came to try and think about how we would translate that to an experience for an audience, mm. Mm. I was kind of like, okay, but you, you will have visual learners and you'll have, mm. like I'm a yeah. very visual learner yeah. Yeah. and I can do all right with learning through these, learning through the body, mm. stressful to me. Mm. So like, how do you create like kinesthetic of the body ways of learning and experiencing mm. politics mm. that aren't just like the theatre of the protest? Mm. Um, so that was the approach, mm. trying mm. to demystify everything. Mm -hmm. mm. The economic session was the economic sessions were the most interesting. It felt like that was the biggest point of I don't understand what this is, so mm -hmm. I don't engage mm -hmm. with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then Duncan yeah. in particular was like, "It's easy," mm -hmm. and everyone was like, "Oh yeah!" <laughs> so um, that was really interesting. Mm -hmm. There's a word that you've used a few times, is um, or a couple of times, is empowered people mm. feeling empowered. Um, I don't like that word. No, I hate that word. Um, <laughs> I, it, it kind of, it, and also I'm sort of thinking about that the the journey I've taken from kind of being 18, feeling like I didn't know any of those things that you've just described, or hadn't had any of that ed kind of educational access in, to information that you've just described. So I felt I was not, um, I could not vote. Mm. Uh, I think that that. I maintained that for two, possibly three elections. I now look back on that younger self and think, Wah! what are you doing? Um, but I did politics A-level. That's the only right, reason why yeah. I felt empowered. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. I had spent two years being taught how that system right. worked. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I, there was a confidence I got from that that I've always carried. And obviously yeah. now I work in like this job. Yeah. So, um, but should that education be compulsory, do you think? Or should there be, if not, I mean, compulsory kind of is a horrible word as well, but should it, should there be? So, okay, so I've just finished the Carla's book, yeah, so I might be being a bit influenced by that. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I don't know if I would, like, trust the school system no. that we currently have yeah. To, yeah, yeah, <laughs> to educate yeah. people on politics, yeah, because yeah, yeah. I feel like... Um, A couple of years ago, when we started uh, the Missy Elliott project, which is about working with young people, mm. we spoke to a guy from, what's the name of that theatre in like, it's got the egg, what's it called? Bath, I can't remember. The egg, oh, isn't it? What? Is it another it one? might have just been a publicity yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it was like, all I can remember is this egg. I think it was like in Ghent or somewhere like oh, that. It was okay. on the continent somewhere. And we were talking about working with young people in the UK and he was Campo. kind of, yeah. yeah. And so this guy from Campo was kind of like, I find working with children in the UK really depressing mm. because everything about your school system encourages them to come in, look at the teacher and be told what to do. And he was like, before you can do anything with them, you have to spend like ages trying to break that down it's because everything about the system yeah. puts that there. Yeah. And this is where I say it sounds a bit of Carla, right? Talk about the system and that. Mm. But I think it's true. Mm. I'm really aware that like, this is where I think the shift comes at uni mm. is that you go from school where mm. it's like, these are the hoops, jump through them and pass mm. your A-levels. Mm. And then you go to uni and it's like, think for yourself. And yeah, you're like, what? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I'd be really scared about, you know, the government setting the learning yeah, yeah. about the government because yeah. that's not going to encourage you to question it and imagine and ask new things of mm. it. Um, and w when we say political education, what are we talking about? Is a political education understand how parliament, understanding how parliament works? Or is a political education knowing how to plan a protest? Mm. Is it knowing mm. how to write mm. a press release? Mm. Is it knowing about how to write a zine and disseminate it amongst mm. your community? Mm. Is it understanding how benefits work? Mm. Is it, what, what does that mean? Yeah. And different, different things are going to be useful for different bits of society. Mm. Because I feel like if you go to the right school, you'll get a great political education mm. because they're going to want to teach you how to run the country mm. like your dad did and his mm. dad did. Mm. So, yeah. 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 Um, so <laughs> we are past the halfway mark, uh, but only just at the halfway mark on the questions that I've got. So I'm going to do one more, I think, and then invite you to ask questions uh, in 
safe in the knowledge that I have way loads to go, so it's, you don't have to, but it's an invitation, uh, and it'd be lovely to draw you in. Um, the one that I uh, thought I would jump to uh, is uh, what is useful, particularly given what you've just said about um, the education system, what is useful about an art context in which to think about these ideas, think about politics, think about uh, I'm, I'm also, when I'm asking that, thinking about the number of artists who say, well, I wouldn't say that my work is political, or they say, no, my work is political, but it's with a small p, or, and kind of, what is that wariness among artists to acknowledge yes. the politicism of their work? So, um... I'm not from that school. Mm, mm. I'm like very much from a uh, Scotty inspired school of, if it's not political, what's the point? Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so uh, that's, that's not me. Mm. However, where I do feel something which is maybe <gasps> not on the same street, but in the same suburb maybe, mm -hmm. is that I really shy away from the terminology of activist. Yeah. Um, I hate it when artists describe themselves as activists. Mm -hmm. I hate it. Um, even though some of them totally are. Mm. But it stresses me out because activist is a big word to me. Mm. And I, d I don't know if I... I understand the politics that placing it on yourself can give you a purpose and a focus and a clarity. Mm. But I... Even though I didn't like that, like... Penny Arcade show that was all like old woman, old man mm. shouts at cloud. Mm. Um, something which she said within it is that activist is a label that your community places on you because of the work and the change you've created within mm. that community. Yeah. Um, and that's how I feel mm. about that terminology. Mm. So I wonder sometimes if an artist is aware of the fact that they're just making the work they want to make. Mm -hmm. Like they're mm -hmm. not making it to change the world. Yeah. Those things are in there because they're in the world, mm. but they're not doing it to do something. Mm. I also think this is a big thing with like socially engaged work and something that me and Emma were talking about the train on the way down here which is that, like, there are limits to what art can do. Mm -hmm. There are brilliant, important things that art can do. Mm -hmm. It can set up what is essentially a thought experiment, which means that you can try something out in a safe space. Mm -hmm. It can give people the energy that keeps them going. Like, mm -hmm. um, there is a, there's a really beautiful quote, I think, from... I'm not going to name their name because I don't know their name for sure. But they were talking about how there's no move for political change in history that hasn't had an artistic movement mm. running alongside it and supporting it. And there is a reason for mm. that, which is that like people need it to keep going or they need it to join the movement. Mm. So there are brilliant, important things that art does. Mm. But is it a... Is it panacea? Is that the word? Mm. Like a fix-all? Mm. Is art that? No. no. Yeah. yeah. It can't be. Also, yeah. artists in general get pleasure from making mm. art. They enjoy mm. it. It's fulfilling. There's a load of ego stuff going on. Mm. Politics isn't meant to be that, mm. especially mm. if it's oh, break the system politics. Mm. It's meant to be very serious. It's meant to be very hard for you, mm. agonising. Mm. You're not mm. enjoying it. So, mm. like, mm. Uh, is it political if I've had a good time? <laughs> is it political yeah. if I've learnt things about myself? Um, is it political if it's changed my life, but mm -hmm. it hasn't, you know, made a politician, I don't like, disappear in a puff yeah, of smoke? Yeah, yeah. So I think those are the reasons why people move away from it. Mm. But I remember doing like a provocation that can live art unfuck the world thing mm. that Helen Cole had. Mm. Provocation made me so mad, but I think that was the point. Mm. Um, and I was kind of like, I'm less interested in what artists can do with art. I'm more interested in what they can just do as people. Mm. Like. Mm -hmm. I think this was something that you told... No, this was something that Chris Good said to me, mm. um, which is that he was trying to find a way that his art didn't have to do all the things. Yeah. His art didn't have to be what brought him together with his community mm. and what changed the world yeah. and what blur and what blur and what blur. Mm. So it's this thing where I can kind of go, OK, I really care about food justice and food poverty but i don't want to make a piece of art about that i don't mm. think that's the best way to engage mm. with that i think it's better if i volunteer at my food bank mm. so i'll do that mm -hmm. um mm. whereas if i'm kind of like <laughs> uh 
uh, not to oversimplify salt, but racism is bad. Mm -hmm. Like a theatre mm -hmm. show is a very good way of like making a point about that. Being able to essentially lock people in a trigger chamber and go, yeah, that's how it feels. Yeah, Get yeah. out is effective. Yeah. So I think mm -hmm. it's just about what can art do? When can it do it? And mm -hmm. also, where is it going? Yeah. That's a big yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, when we were thinking about how sortition would be experienced for an audience, something we were super aware of was that for it to be effective and challenging, you would need a really varied audience of people, mm -hmm. that a massive chunk of that work, of that creative mm -hmm. energy, would have to go into bringing together different groups of people who aren't coming together mm -hmm. to talk about these yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which is interesting to me. For me, that's one of the things, I mean, uh, that's something that I do on a much smaller scale is post-show conversations with kind of maybe this number of people, maybe this number of people sometimes about theatre. And it's always bringing, even though that even given the sort of arts adjacent thing, um, it's always bringing people together for a conversation that wouldn't happen otherwise. And that feels like a really important thing that art can do is make space for that conversation. Mm. Um, uh, would anyone like to ask a question knowing I've got another at least five, so you don't have to, but it would be lovely to hear from anyone who has got a question. Hello. Hi. Um, I think I've got a question about the politics of tolerance. Mm. Um, and I was thinking about um, the, what your thoughts were about the sortition project and picking up on this idea of the desirability or not of consensus or the fantasy of consensus in relation to the, I think, um, something like Chris Thorpe's confirmation, which I know mm. you've like, been in dialogue with in your own work, which sort of is questioning the value, the political value of, of tolerance of different mm. kinds of um, political positions. So I'm just wondering if you could put sortition and tolerance mm -hmm. in conversation for us. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. Um, so maybe I should like start with a disclaimer, which is I hate the word tolerance. It's such a like milk toast approach to things. Mm -hmm. Is that even right? I don't know if that's the right word. Anyway, um, like in the same way that you want that difference between like consent and enthusiastic consent, there's something I want that is more than tolerance. It's like an active, joyful mm. embrace, not a sort of weary, resentful resignation, which is how tolerance feels to me. Um, so there's an interesting, because confirmation came up actually when we were planning the workshop week. It's why we wanted to have an experimental psychologist in the room, because we were kind of like, how are we working with confirmation bias in this room? How are we working with is it that I want to say here? How are we working with the various fears that people bring into the room and what silences them and what opens them up? So I guess if I run the thought experiment in my mind of sortition happening, so we elect 650 people to parliament by jury service methods, we're going to get people from all over the country with all of their different experiences. And you would have to completely change the education system, right? Because you would have to teach. You couldn't be in the South and not understand what it is to be in a northern mining mm -hmm. town, mm -hmm. because you might be in Parliament and have to make decisions mm -hmm. for that. Mm -hmm. You couldn't be like the one South Asian family in like a rural town in North Yorkshire and like, I don't know, what is it that I'm trying to get at? You would have to learn about each other in a really different way and the conversations that would be had would be different because I guess I'm trying to think about the framework around, sorry, this is really messy because I'm thinking about it and it's like images I can't articulate very well. So I guess I'm thinking about Diane Abbott in Parliament right now and how tolerance is working out for her 
Uh, and I guess I'm thinking about something that Mike Savage told us, which is that this is like, that the big change that happens after like post-war consensus into neoliberalism is that when we come out of Thatcher's rule, those politi- the majority of politicians are no longer using the services that they are responsible for running. Right. So it means that they have no vested interest mm. in, in their personal lives and what they're doing. And that's not to say they don't care politically, spiritually. I'm not, I'm not going down that route, but just there's a difference between cutting funds to the hospital you use and cutting funds to a hospital you would never even have to consider using because you can go private. Mm. And so I'm thinking if you have a group of people from all of those different walks of life and they have to form consensus, so they have to form common, they have to find commonality. You have a really difficult political system, but I don't think getting rid of the things that block intolerance is as easy as bringing people together because I'm thinking of all the people who are like not racist because they've dated a black girl, Mm, not homophobic mm, because they've got mm. a gay friend. Mm. Um, And I feel like the projects needed to change the way that tolerance works in the UK are bigger and broader than that. It's like a whole, this makes me think of something that one of our participants, Caitlin from Belfast, spoke about a lot, which is that to do away with political parties is to completely change British identity, Mm -hmm. that who we vote for and how we vote for them is a big part of how we understand being British. It's a big part of how we understand our history and it's bound up in empire. Mm -hmm. So if you get rid of that, you then have to completely rebuild British identity. Mm -hmm. It should be hellish. Like, I'd quite like my kids to do it, but I don't want to live through that. I'm tired. <laughs> so, um, I think... I'm wondering if um, something that's so interesting in you talk, hearing you talk about boot camp, because the word representation feels to me to be at the heart of this, which is, mm. I was really interested in... Um, so, a number of the boot camp participants wrote these amazing letters mm. after that week and that journey that they travelled on, not to do an X-factor journey, <laughs> so, but, you know, they'd obviously had this extraordinary experience um, awakening. Mm. And um, I wondered whether you talked about the, the process of representation and who you're representing. Because mm. it, it feels to me that you might, one might come in as an individual representing oneself. Mm. And then the, the nature of sortition with 12 people is who are you? I, mm. I remember the tweets that they sent on the way down to mm. the big camp. They said, um, you know, representing Northern Ireland. <laughs> there was a real sense of yeah. knowing that they were coming from a place and representing that place. I wondered if that had come up much in the. the it day. did. And what I found really interesting was that. So, Caitlin, who was from Belfast, my girl was carrying loads, loads, because it's representing a place that is really charged at the moment, which after the repeal the 8th, was it repeal mm, the 8th? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was yeah. like, is it the 8th or the 11th? Mm, after yeah, repeal yeah, the 8th yeah. was kind of like, yeah, but what about us? After Brexit mm. was like, yeah, but what about us? Mm. And has a history that just isn't widely taught mm. in England or Wales or Scotland and isn't widely understood. And she felt that, she really felt mm. this need in so many conversations mm. to be like, Hey, so Northern Ireland. Mm. In contrast, there we had, was it two people from Scotland? Maybe more? Yeah, we had Beldina and we had Katie. Um, so they could do Scotland together. Mm. So it was all right. Mm, mm. Like, uh, Monique and Beldina were both black, so they could do that together. Like, um, <laughs> Beldina. Uh, has dual citizenship in Kenya. Samal had dual citizenship in Portugal. They could do that together, but it's sort of moving really rapidly from conversation to conversation, who you need to be and how you've got to stand up for yourself, stand up for your people, when you want to do that, when you want to push back against that. But I also think the idea of 
there's this really oft quoted like Zora Neale Hurston quote which is uh, skin folk doesn't mean kin folk which mm-hmm. I enjoy a lot yeah. um, and I'm like a something which I think is starting to become more and more prevalent definitely in black British activist circles is that there is it's small but there's like a growing black middle class who Mm. will become a black Mm. establishment Mm -hmm. and a lot of what they aspire to (laughs) and aim for is in tension with the black activist traditions Mm. that existed before Mm. that were immigrant led and working class led Mm. and also Mm. politically black Mm. uh, rather than necessarily from like African and Caribbean descendants Mm. Mm. so it means that actually you can't guarantee that someone from your group has the same interests as you and wants to be represented in the same way Mm. and I kind of I really hope that that starts to crumble more, actually, mm. which feels like a weird thing to say, because mm. it's a comfort blanket, those like pockets of identity, the idea that we can build solidarity because we're women, we can build solidarity because we're mm. queer, mm. but I don't know if it works anymore. Mm. I don't know if the prevalence of intersectionality as an idea as well also makes that harder to maintain. Mm. And I don't know how useful it is in politics, because there are... Yeah, I'm going to end it there. I'm not going to... Mm-hmm. Is that all right? Mm-hmm. How does that translate? Can I ask another question? Uh, Depends if you're going to jump ahead of Jenny or not. <laughs> so <laughs> I did, it. <laughs> I, I, coming back to that, you used that term, the potential for art spaces like this to be safe spaces, mm-hmm. for us to find safe ideas, that, that phrase. And I'm wondering how, well, it's a big thing we're thinking about mm-hmm. a lot, which is... Um, that can, that can only happen if you're really starting to change who feels this is for them, how they're represented here. Because mm. otherwise it's a safe space for people that already, already feel safe. safe. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And I'm wondering whether that came up at all in terms of boot camp, um, even though they were arts adjacent mm. talking to a few of them, I've, I certainly experienced that. You know, a few people were like, oh, I've never, I've never been to a place like this before. Mm. And just asking kind of how, how does that feel, being mm. part of something which is changing, which is going to change, but yeah. you know, there's barriers to pull down. So something which I think um, Dawn Walton, who's the artistic director of Eclipse and who I love a great deal, um, said it like, I think it was a talk about diversity, our role for <laughs> diversity. And she said that you if you change the people who are on stage and you change who works in the building, you change who comes. So um, I don't necessarily feel comfortable in a space like this. I've had my work here three times and there's still a part of me that's like, nah. Um, Which means, I hope, that I kind of have an idea of what changes I want to make in that space so it doesn't feel like um, it's not a space for me. I think my favourite thing about the Bootcamp Week was having these three massive spaces and then being doing very different things because we were living in those spaces like this one room where people are like napping or meditating or writing stuff down calling their mum, blah, blah, blah. Another room where people are cooking and talking and eating and working. So this means that the room smells different and it tastes different. There's like a bit where we're sitting on bean bags. That's not like high art, straight back to chair stress. Mm. Um, There's loads of stuff on the walls that you put there. Um, Then there was another room which when we first came in was like straight tables notepads and it was like ah (laughs) we did a talk we did a talk and I was like oh my god everyone's bored it's just like school oh my god (laughs) so then we were kind of like okay how do we feel about this room and everyone was like okay we have to keep it like this because we need the tables and we all need to see but at least we made a decision that that's how we want this room Mm. then when we finish doing these like weird UN Skype things we'll get rid of it Mm. and we'll have it be more messy so I think when Grayson Perry did that big, is it the Leaf lectures that happen mm, every year? He said this lectures, thing where he was like, mm, and I don't agree with this completely, but he was like, it's arrogant to walk into a gallery and immediately think that you're going to get it. He was kind of like, it takes a while, you have to keep going back. 
and I don't agree with the arrogance. Mm. Uh, I think it's a very yeah. arrogant thing for him yeah, to have said. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I do think that the there's some patience about patience, yeah. about going yeah. back, and also about it mm. being okay for people to be bored mm -hmm. or for people yeah. to not get it. Yeah. Um, I can remember like, having a conversation with Johnny after uh, a talk with Sortitia and I asked him how it went. He gave this really long answer. He went, what did you think? I said, I thought it was really boring. And he went, yeah, me too. Mm -hmm. oh, all right, great. Mm -hmm. And I was like, cool. And he spoke loads yeah. more after that. So, but this is where conversation, like the importance of conversation comes in. Yeah. Like the, the, it, the encounter is not enough. It's the conversation, yeah. and it's also the conversation that, that helps people who felt bored or felt they didn't understand or felt um, mm. unwelcome. Uh, it, it can help to sort of process and move beyond those feelings as mm. well. Um, I mean, pardon me, I also think that like this particular building is hard. It's like hard lines, metal, concrete, echoey. Like, um, it's not an easy space to make feel intimate and cosy, even because the ceilings are high, amongst mm. other things like it. Yeah, it's, it's really, really hard. I think the building pushes back. Mm. Um, but then I think about the room downstairs, that front room space, yeah, which yeah. I like immediately liked. Yeah. But that's because like a library is a safe space yeah. to me immediately. Yeah. Did you have a question, Jenny? I did. I think I've had about five more questions. <laughs> As you were speaking, it's so fascinating. I think I um, want to take you back to the, the more political side mm. of the I'm so fascinated by you know, how we find a different system to the one that doesn't seem to work mm. very well. Um, and I, and I, you talked a lot about education. And I was thinking while we were talking about 650 people coming in through Sortition, I was thinking about the civil service and thinking mm -hmm. about a lot about what you've just been talking about mm -hmm. in a way about how how that would need to change yeah. so that mm -hmm. their job would be to make people feel comfortable, mm -hmm. to make people feel safe to express whatever mm -hmm. they want, how mm -hmm. they would actually then take those decisions and do anything and how mm -hmm. they would stop being... Um, I suppose uh, just kind of taking advantage completely of the mm. situation of having uh, 650 totally naive mm. people mm. coming in in their view and mm. being able to kind of run the whole country themselves without really, you know, just saying yes, Minister, but not actually kind of doing anything about it. And I was just beginning to think about in your in your boot camp week, what you, you were giving the people that you were working with masses of fascinating information and that that's sort of still the educative mm. process but in terms of getting them to make decisions mm. that could be then put into practice what sort of did you did you begin to discuss with them any kind of structural you know what the what the basket structure would be around they them? started to discuss them um, yeah like way before i uh -huh. did um, because that was what they were anxious about. Yeah. Um, and anxious is the word, like a palpable mm. anxiety in the room. How does it work? Mm. <laughs> How does it like <laughs> tangibly actually work? Yeah. Um, so we took them through some examples of where it has worked. And I, it's that really scary thing, isn't it? Which is that if you set up a system, if you create a system, you are necessarily outside of that system. So you hold a certain amount of control over it. So. What I want to do, which is, you know, probably like my inner dictator, is um, be like, what you would want to do is create this framework that your 650 people then step into. But the problem is that who is setting that framework? How are they brought together? How do they have the expertise to do it? And I guess it's consultative, right? So you're working with experts and citizens and you're looking at where it has worked already. Yeah, I guess you would put it together by an assorted assembly and then you'd figure out what you were going to do with the civil service. I remember learning about them at school and like visibly deflating. Like just being like, so mm. what's the point? Mm. What's the point in all of this if they're just there and they just do what they want? I know they don't do what they want, but I was 18. I, I was thinking um, for, um, about jury services. So, mm. um, one of the things 
that most impressed me about the whole system because we were there 12 people who'd never met and came from all walks of life and we were given you know one decision to make both and we sat for five days mm. and listened to everybody but at the end the judge who had had a lifetime's experience of this said um, I can tell you the law you need to make the decision and mm. it was absolutely empowering yeah. us to make the decision and mm. we then knew that the decision was a very very important one it was about whether someone would go to prison or not and getting to the heart of the truth and reaching a consensus mm. which we had to do mm. was was our job and we had been given the responsibility to do mm. it whatever mm. our you know whatever our educational background and whatever our political views and my goodness we took it really 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 seriously mm. but that was just one decision and that mm. took us five days you mm. know so it was mm -hmm. and, and more than a day to make that decision mm. so I think there's a practical thing about kind of how much that the, sort of the judge type person, the civil service, can support the kind of masses of decisions. A really useful text for me when putting this together, uh, I can't remember who it's by, sorry, my brain is cheese, but it's called um, A Use for Your Broken Clay Parts. And it was. Um, what is it? It's like what's left. It's like the tangible remnants of an art piece mm. that he did, this man in England, Germany, France, Belgium. And he went and he held all of these different sessions with like audiences of like 40, 50, 30 people and put together by consensus what is essentially a constitution which talks you through how a country would run by sortition. So he spoke about... So what you have is like this kind of list of laws of how often people are elected, how they can say they don't want to consent to do it, um, how the different groups break down, how the jobs within the civil service would work. Um, it's ridiculously detailed and kind of boring in a really interesting way. Um, but I can't remember all of it because I've not read it since like August. But again, I, I kind of was really moved by the fact that he'd been able essentially to crowdsource this structure and had been able to kind of work through it by like giving the audience, I think the audience gets some time to read what he's mm -hmm. written mm -hmm. and then people go, people can nominate what they want to make changes on and then as an audience they made the changes until he got to one where an audience didn't want to make any changes mm -hmm. and then it was done. Um, and something I was really struck by is that every bit of the government would divide into sort of smaller subgroups that were responsible for one thing. Because I think getting 650 people to reach consensus is... Yeah. How would you even <laughs> negotiate that? Yeah, yeah. But maybe you can kind of go, OK, so here are 50 people and they're working on this bit of government mm -hmm. and they split into like five subgroups that are looking at X, Y and Z. And what I also thought was interesting about that was that it anticipated things being time consuming mm -hmm. and taking a really long mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. to get anything done. Um, but also the idea that that was okay. But it thought through all of it, like processes mm -hmm. to like reverse things, processes to put things in place. And I, I find that when I think about our boot camp participants and how one of the first things they knew they wanted to set up was universal income mm. and very quickly they were kind of talking about how much that should be if it was too much would people still do the things that kept society mm. working how does it work if you're an immigrant at what point do you start getting it um how would it be paid like i think people very quickly go literal if mm. they feel like they have the tools to do that mm. because they take it seriously mm. so they're kind of like the questions come up and they want the answers. Mm -hmm. Which maybe I don't, because I'm more like, ooh. <laughs> um, but that's part of my job, right? Yeah. I think. I think it is. Yeah. 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 We have about, I'm just going to do a quick time check, about 10 minutes, is it? Yeah, about 10 minutes. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> thank you, this is so fascinating. I also have about 17 questions, but uh, I'll try and formulate one that's slightly coherent. So it strikes me what something that you come back to again and again is, is this idea of care. I'm going to push you a little bit on um, on uh, on the relationship between art and politics because like because there's a sense I think that um, something that I've come across many times um, in my own thinking that activism is something that happens out there mm -hmm. and in public. 
Sunday. Mm. And uh, there's some really amazing work on, on the silence of Brexit, actually, like mm. how quiet the Brexit vote was. Um, and um, but then there's then there's the other side, which is um, which is something that Akuba and Julia talks up about a lot, which is which is which is the politics of care work, and particularly between between women and um, and it, and I mean I work on literature, and in fiction you see it happens to be women, um, but it could be other other implications. Um, having to ha ne ne the, the necessity of having to work in private or in in spaces that are considered to be private and mm. intimate so when you're to when you're talking about um making an intimate space making it making it making a safe space that really struck me that that what you're what we're also talking about is kind of creating a space that can be political but also can can have the conditions mm. of, can contain the conditions of care mm. and then consensus being the work of of care because when you're doing it, this is a question. I'm just hoping that it'll be a question mark at the end at some point. Um, <laughs> when you're doing work, it, uh, uh, when you're doing activism and, and it's in, and it's in a ca it, it's it's in that kind of in it, it's under under those conditions. You can let things go, which mm. which which has to happen in mm. order for consensus to happen. You have to come to the point you say, okay, like I have these other things, but I'm gonna as an individual, I'm gonna have to let this go. And if people can come together and do that as a group, then you've got something that mm. looks like it, and it has to be long term because it has to be based on. So I just wanted to push you a little, and I think art is completely fundamental to mm. that, to that, to that version of politics. So uh, because that's where you get the models of like relations and interactions and the understanding of, you know, empathy and all the things that. So there you go. That's my that's my statement. Okay, <laughs> I was waiting for your voice to go up at the end if there's something to be a question. I love a Kruger dearly. Um, and I was thinking when you were talking about Saidia Hartman yes. and her theories around care yes. and her arguing that violence is the antidote to care um, and that being a political thing, which I think is really strong. Um, also, just want to like pull myself up on use of the terminology terminology safe space mm. no such thing safe first space mm. um also thinking about uh being in a activist space that was organized around violence against women and how that space had to have care at its heart to enable people to be there so there has to be a crash someone at the beginning has to say i got the kids um which I used to do because I didn't want to do any of the hard work. Um, looking after kids is hard, hard work. work yeah, but I didn't, right. didn't want to like talk about things mm. like I talk about all the time for work, but I was like, I can watch your kids for two hours. Yeah, can do that. So there has to be a crash. Um, the space has to be accessible and people have to talk about anything that they might need in the space to make it easier for them. If it's too much text, is it going to be difficult? Mm -hmm. If there's too much talking, are you going to get overwhelmed? Do you have visual snow? Do we need a certain type of lighting? Um, then you've got to think about what time it is and how people are going to get there and whether people are going to be safe to get there. Are they going to need their taxis covered when they go home? Mm -hmm. So for me, care, access, those are the things that mean that people who are excluded from so many rooms can be in your room doing the work. Mm -hmm. It's like, care's such a soft word, but I don't think it's a soft thing. I think it's like walking boots and mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a powerful word. But also like care is there so people can do the work. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the thing that people forget all the time. I can remember mm -hmm. like kicking off about safe spaces on Twitter like a few years ago and having a load of like new statesman people come for me <laughs> about it. And me being like, what do you think we do in safe spaces? Do you think we like sit around and sing Kumbaya and cry? I mean, we do cry, but also part of the reason why the space is safe safe or the space is like held by only people who are queer or only people of colour or only women of colour or whatever is so that we can lose the space that is spent making you f mm. feel comfortable so we can do the work that isn't being done so all of it for me is about making sure that people can be there on an equal footing to do the work um, 
Because sometimes the most interesting and important voices are the ones that are having the hardest time getting in the room. Um, also, we all like, it's like the descendant of like post-colonial subjects. We inherit a legacy of activists who have burnt out or who have died because the care was not in place and the money and the resource was not in place. And I really hope that the focus on models of care that we see coming up mm. is able to change that. Mm. Remember there was this really sort of quietly terrifying article in the New Yorker that was saying ah, that like people don't become more conservative as they get older, is that a lot of people with radical opinions have died by the time they get to a certain place. Oh God. It's horrific, it's horrific. And then yeah. I was like, when I think of some of the academic, some of the epidemics of recent years mm. that will have wiped out generations of people, mm. yes, I can understand that. So, care is like this urgent, urgent thing. It's so urgent and so important. Um, because also you're asking people to be vulnerable. When you ask someone to make a big political decision about them and the people around them, you're asking them to really, really put loads at risk. Mm. Um, that guy that I referenced who does those assorted assemblies spoke about how because everyone was looked after, they were all in a good humour, as he put it. So they were able to hear things they disagreed with mm. and they were able to trust that people were saying stuff from like, a place of good intentions. And I don't mean to be all like kippy about it. I know it's not that easy, but I think, you know, when there's a friend and they're doing something and it's hurting your feelings. And sometimes you can really, sometimes you're like, I just can't talk to you about this right now. We're like, I can't talk to you about it. And then something will happen. And maybe you're in a smoking area and it's really quiet and it's really peaceful they're in the right frame of mind, you're in the right frame of mind, and you're able to have that really difficult conversation. I think there's like a lot of that in politics, like the, how often is the environment lending itself to a good conversation? It's interesting that, that, that you're talking about that in the context of activism and politics, um, but it immediately makes me think about that conversation in the context of art making mm -hmm. and Rhea Hartley's work with Ecologies of Care and um, all the artists or possible art potential artists who are excluded from the art world because of the lack of care in in the art world. In the, I mean, I, I'm using art world very loosely there. I only really know about theatre mm -hmm. and performance um, where I feel that there is, particularly for an industry that is founded in communication, there is a lot of work to do around communication, around care, around access, that is taking a very long time to happen. Something which feels really hard for me in the arts is that sometimes you are asking for care from people who haven't been cared for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's really hard. It's a really hard thing for you to ask of them mm. and it's a really hard thing for them to like get their head around. Um, and I guess it's thinking about, again, how care isn't seen as soft and weakness mm. now it's mm -hmm. seen as strong. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. We're about two minutes off the end. We asked you three questions at the beginning and then we left <laughs> no time to come back to them. So, uh, so in, the, in the final minutes, we can either come back to those three questions or you can just take them home with you, have a reminder of what they were if you want, uh, or uh, one of you can ask one more question, or I will ask one more question. Uh, what would everyone prefer? Reach consensus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Right, if no one's jumping in with a question, I'm gonna, I want to really quickly come back to the suffragettes. 
that's the that's the thing i yeah. feel like yeah we haven't spoken we about haven't at spoken all. about and we'll might give us like take us for another 20 minutes so yeah, yeah like what can we say about your relationship with the suffragettes i'm much more interested in them as activists and organizers than i am as this sort of moment in history where everything changed mm. and i was one of the most kind of rewarding experiences i had was inviting Shadeen Taylor Stone to Bristol and interviewing her as like a current black feminist, like award winning mm -hmm. organizer and activist, mm -hmm. the impact that they have on her and her speaking about um, Sylvia Pankhurst and her work in Ethiopia with the Rastafarians and her mm -hmm. work as like a queer organizer. Um, I don't feel like I know any of that stuff. No! Yeah. And I was kind of like, that's crazy exciting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's like so inspiring and so important, so important mm -hmm. to see that like, there were always allies and there were always mm -hmm. radical allies mm -hmm. and there were always people that were leveraging their privilege. Mm -hmm. Like that mm -hmm. was really exciting to me. Um, mm -hmm. What I wanted the work to do with the suffragettes legacy is similar to what I feel sisters and cut do with their legacy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is to align and then disrupt. So you kind of go, this is their legacy. And now I build on it and push it further because mm -hmm. they were radical for their time. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if representational electoral democracy is radical mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also the legacy that has been chosen to be recorded in history. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think it's interesting because my first introduction to the suffragettes at school was listening to the recordings of somebody being force fed in assembly. Mm, mm. Went to an all girls school. Mm. Miss Inchman, she was a real <laughs> feminist. So, like, that was the headmistress. So, that was my first introduction mm. to them, mm. was just sitting with our eyes closed listening yeah. to that. And then her being like, okay yeah, this is who these people were yeah, yeah. so it's odd that kind of i went from that very radical introduction <coughs> to them to then the last big swell of interest around the suffragettes was that film coming out mm -hmm. which yeah. generated a lot of and there were good things about the film and there were weird things about the film mm -hmm. but i wanted to i guess be more inspired by doing something that people thought was just nonsensical. Mm, yeah. Like when we first advertised the call out for Sortition and someone was like, it's going to be like Love Island. And as a big fan of Love <laughs> Island, I was like, great. But um, kind of, there was a similar kind mm. of, this is ridiculous mm, mm, response mm. to women voting. Mm, so I think mm. maybe I was doing something right there. Mm, maybe. Yeah. Mm. All I've got to say for now. Is that all right? Yeah. 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 I think we uh, we we've hit an end point. So um, thank you, thank everyone, you for coming, for coming <laughs> listening, and asking questions. And yeah, thank Thanks. you, Selena. Thanks, Maddie. Yeah. <laughs>